Let me begin with Ambassador Trujillo, who I've known for a long time. I'm excited and very supportive of your, your nomination. Uh, one of the things I'm excited about is the way, you know, this is a committee that oversees the State Department and diplomacy, and, and the way you've reinvigorated diplomacy is, at the OAS is a story that has not been told enough. Obviously, we're not members of the Lima Group and its, and its uh, response to the Venezuelan crisis, but the supporting role the U.S. has played is in no small part due to your efforts, but particularly the uh, the invocation of the, of the Rio Treaty, which is a mu mutual defense uh, agreement in the hemisphere in December of 2019, I know took a lot of uh, diplomatic, old-fashioned diplomatic work behind the scenes uh, with our partner nations in the region, and and um, and I think is no is in no small part d d uh, due, due to you've been a major player in that effort. I wanted to talk with you about two of the irritant points in our hemisphere. The first is is uh, is Cuba. It's interesting, you know. There's a lot of talk about the embargo. I, to this day, there's still not a lot of Japanese or German cars on the streets. Uh, there's no German or Japanese embargo, although there are Mercedes that are being driven by government officials. But, but they basically are able to buy any product they want from anywhere in the world. The reason why they can't has nothing to do with the U.S. embargo. It has to do with the fact that the government there has no plan for developing its economy. The model of the aging leaders of that regime has basically been how do we hold on to power and restrict the both economic and political freedoms of people to do so. Um, I think that's manifested, most the desperation's manifested in their recent announcement now that they're allowing people to, to buy in dollars with no fees attached. They used to take 10% of the dollars that were sent over there. It's just because their currency is worthless around the world, so they need, they need people to pull dollars out of the, you know, underneath their cushions or get more remittances sent sent to them so that they can have more dollars circulating than they can use to buy things. But, but this policy of control is largely evidenced by a, a military company that controls the economy and the Communist Party that controls their politics. Um, but a lot of the key people in that regime that are left are in their 80s and early 90s, and so let's just say that they're not going to live forever. Is there any hope in your mind that there's, I'm not saying there's a bunch of people there that are Democrats and believe in the values of, of, of freedom and liberty, but is there any hope that there is some new generation of leadership at some point uh, within that government that would begin to move on some of these issues regarding economic and political freedoms? Thank you, Senator, for your question and your kind words. I do. I've spent a significant amount of time over the last two years working with the civil society, working with some of the younger people, working with some of the entrepreneurs, and they yearn for all the things that America has. They yearn for freedom. They yearn for independent press. They yearn for democracy. They yearn for, for economic empowerment. Uh, and I think now with social media and the, the sharing of information and how quickly information is accessible, these folk tales of how evil the Yankee empire is no longer hold true. Uh, people could go on the internet and see for themselves that why does my cousin who live in Miami have a nice pair of jeans and a decent house and some food on the table, and I who live in Santiago am starving to death. Uh, so I think there's a lot of hope. I think the civil society in Cuba is better organized than people give them credit under very, very difficult circumstances. On the issue of Venezuela, would you agree that it's a mistake to view the Maduro regime as a government as opposed to a criminal enterprise, an organized crime syndicate that happens to control a national territory? I agree with your assessment. It's an illegitimate regime that's been said and is deemed as much not only by the United States but by multiple countries across the world. And Mr. Billingsley, on the Iranian UN restrictions that are in place now, um, if, if those come off, I believe in October, would they then be allowed to sell weapons to, for example, Venezuela? Well, Senator, <clears throat> unfortunately, the regime, the Iranian regime, is proliferating weaponry, uh, and I think in in a, in a different setting, it would be good to make sure. Well, you will have as on the Intelligence Committee access to all of that information. The concern would be that they will have much more ready access to buy weaponry from the Russians and Chinese who will no longer technically be prohibited uh, from selling to them under the embargo. And on the question of arms control, I think it's by now, I hope, well established in the minds of most people that no one can win a, a nuclear war fought with strategic nuclear weapons in which each side exchanges 1,500 warheads against each other. That's not a war, not only a war you can't win, it's the end of the world. What is a danger? is the use of tactical nuclear weapons on the battlefield to escalate a fight in order to de-escalate. The notion that you could use a nuclear weapon, artillery or whatever it might be, a short-range missile, to sort of stop in a conflict and the belief that that somehow, that, that would not spiral into something bigger. Uh, is that not 
at the end of the day, the, the area we should be most concerned about and the Russian violations of these tactical weapons is that they actually think they could potentially use it to win or de-escalate a conflict. Senator, that is, that is exactly right. And that is why we have focused in these Vienna talks on uh, Russian nuclear doctrine. And so as the teams uh, deploy next week, one of the working groups we've agreed is a, is a working group to cover both this matter of warheads and doctrine. Uh, we will be prepared to discuss the nuclear posture review and our thinking <coughs> on nuclear doctrine, but we expect the Russians to be transparent uh, on their doctrine as well. And we are greatly concerned about this concept of escalate to win, particularly when we are talking about a country like Russia that seems to feel free to invade and occupy other nations. Uh, on the case of China, uh, we have a different issue, which is that China... Uh, has not ever been part of an arms control dynamic that has led to the establishment of risk reduction measures, such as hotlines, we have the Nuclear Risk Reduction Center, we have an architecture that was put in place over the many, many years uh, during the Cold War that has allowed us to avoid uh, mishap. Uh, and if China indeed intends to build up the way we believe they will, uh, we must get at this matter of transparency and confidence building measure, measures with the Chinese.